Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear viewers of Imam Hussein TV, welcome to yet another episode of The Valiant. Congratulations to all of you on this, the birth anniversary of our beloved Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam. Where do we begin where we discuss the Colossus that was Ja'far bin Muhammad alayhi salam? Where do we begin where we discuss the knowledge of the Imam, the akhlaq of the Imam, the wisdom of the Imam, the magnificent debates of the Imam, the teachings of the Imam? Who better uh, than to tell us about these, inshallah, than our dear brother Ibrahim al Ansari? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Two wiladas we celebrate today. Not, not who's better. La bil'akis. There are many people that, that would be better uh, than me in, in describing this. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept the small that we can offer. Inshallah. We celebrate two wiladas today. Yes. Ahsan. The wilada of the Holy Prophet, peace be on his family. But that's. In a way, not complete, the 70th of Rabi'ah al-Awwal is not complete without the birth of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Which is what, who, uh, who we'll be talking about today. Ahsant. And where do we begin with this Imam then, with the day of his birth? Uh, what can you tell us about the day of the Imam's birth and how did Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam and his wife Umm Farwa feel when the Imam was born? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen habibi ilah al-alameen Abil Qasim al-Mustafa Muhammad and peace and blessings be upon Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi wa sallatu wa salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon them all, uh, especially on a day like this. When we say uh, peace be upon them on the day that they were born, like the Quran said, yes. peace be upon Imam al-Sadiq alayhi wa sallatu wa salam on this auspicious occasion. The 17th of Rabi'u al-Awwal, what a day that is. A day that is full of happiness, insha'Allah, for our beloved Imam, Imam al-Mahdi, ajallah ta'ala, farjah al-Sharif. Uh, I am sure that Imam al-Mahdi's heart is filled with joy on a day like this when he remembers the birth of two of his grandfathers. The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, as well as Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi abdu salati wa salam. And insha'Allah, this is a day of celebration for the Shia of the Prophet and the Shia of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi afdal salati wa salam and therefore we congratulate yourself, we congratulate uh, insha'Allah the Muslim Ummah and first and foremost the esteemed scholars. Insha'Allah this day not only was it a celebration for us, not only is it a celebration for us I should say, and not only is it a celebration for the Imam of our time, Rather, it was also a day of celebration for Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. For of course, with the birth of the next wali, the next hujja, is surely a birth and is surely an occasion that fills the Imam with joy. He said, how did they feel? I would not be able to know how they felt. But I would definitely know that they felt, with, felt nothing but joy. In fact, this is a day in which Imam Zainul al-Abideen felt the joy for Imam As-Sadiq alayhi afdal salati wa salam born on the 83rd year after Hijrah on the 17th of Rabi'ah al-Awwal means Imam Zainul al-Abidin was present and that Imam As-Sadiq uh, spent two years with his grandfather Imam Zainul al-Abidin for his martyrdom on the year 85 after Hijrah and this is why when he was born Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam the first thing that he did was he brought Imam As-Sadiq alayhi salam to his father Imam Zainul Abidin, and he presented him to him and he said, Oh my father, this is my son and it is upon you to name him. And so Imam Zainul Abidin would name him Ja'far uh, and he was given the title as Sadiq, the truthful one. And subhanAllah, on the same day that he was uh, born as as Sadiq al Amin, the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was also known by this title. And truly, it is amazing the link between the birth of those two great individuals, uh, especially when we say that we are the Shia of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that at least what is mensub to us in terms of fiqh when we come to distinguish between the fiqh of specific scholars, then we go back to what greater scholar is there than Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi afdal salati wa salam for us to be referred back to in terms of jurisprudence, whose knowledge and whose fiqh is none other than the one who is born on the same day, the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You just alluded to the fact that we are all Ja'fari. Mm. How did this come about? 
how important of a role did Imam Sadiq play in the crystallization of Shi'ism or the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt? And how is it that it was this Imam that was able to have this freedom? Why, what, was there, what wasn't there that was there with the other Imams that didn't mm. enable them to have that freedom? So first of all, um, Imam Sadiq alayhi afdal salatu wa salam, this, let's call it this university that he, that he prepared, was not something that he started. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam started this um, and because they had a bit more space in their time, especially in Medina. You see, especially during the time of Imam al-Sadiq, you're going to get shocked with this. Do you know how many from the Umayyad Caliphs, Imam al-Sadiq, how many Umayyad Caliphs were present during the life of Imam al-Sadiq? Give me a guess. Six? Ten. Ten. Ten Umayyad Caliphs. And from the Abbasis, there were two. Which means 12 caliphs were present during the life of Imam Sadiq alayhi wa sallam. Yes, Imam Sadiq lived for 60 uh, something years, 64 years I believe maybe, because he was born 83 after Hijrah. Let's do some maths together. 60, uh, uh, 63 years after Hijrah, he was born and he passed away, sorry, 83, Afwan, 83 years after Hijrah, he was born, and 148 years after Hijrah, he passed away, which means 20 plus 40, and then another 5, 65. 65 years. 65 years, he was, 65 years, in those 65 years, 12 caliphs, 10 from the Umayyad, and two from the Abbasis. The 10 from the Umayyad period prove something, that the Umayyad Caliphate itself was slowly collapsing. Because of those 10 were some of them who were killed. Very similar, if you look at, for example, the Abbasid Caliphate, you will realize that the majority of them, or not the majority, some of them, lived very short lives after their Caliphate, which means they will become a Khalifa, or so-called Khalifa, we should say, for six months, killed. Two years, killed. Year and a half, killed. The Umayyad Caliphate, during the time of Imam al-Sadiq became similar to that. Similar to what you find in the Abbasid Caliphate during the time, for example, of uh, Imam al-Jawad and Imam al-Hadi and Imam al-Askari alayhim of Sati wa salam. Became similar. They started becoming a bit more weak. And especially the people that started taking over the Umayyad Caliphate, well, most of them were from the Marwanis. So even the original Bani Umayyah, let's call them, where you had, for example, Muawiyah and Yazid, and then the son of Yazid that took the caliphate, they themselves were not in the picture anymore. Or the sons of Muawiyah, let's say, per se, from, um, from let's say, the, the male offspring side, it was not them anymore. These were the sons of Marwan ibn al-Hakam. The sons of Marwan ibn al-Hakam, which is why I call them the Marwanis. Yes. So the Marwanis, because they're son of, of, of Marwan. Ta'an Marwan ibn hakim is another story, and this is a Wilad event, so I don't want to get into him. Inshallah, maybe on another occasion, we might, we might be able to talk about him a bit more. Anyway, inshallah, this is not a day to, to remember those individuals. Rather, it is a day to celebrate the life of Imam Sadiq. So, given the weakness of the Umayyad Caliphate, there was a lot, of, lot more space created for the Imam to move in this sense. So, he, est he, he did not establish the school, rather... He increased the school of, of the, that Imam al-Baqir started. He was able to project his opinions more clearly because there wasn't as many people, for example, forcing him in prisons. There wasn't caliphs forcing him house arrest. There wasn't caliphs threatening to kill him and his family. Yes, later on, some of these things did happen. And yes, on occasions, some issues did happen. Like, for example, the burning of his house. He was poisoned at the end. Yes, all of that did happen. However... He had more space in order to um, spread the knowledge of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is why you will find that he had 4,000 students. It's not a small number. 4,000 students who used to narrate from Imam Sadiq alayhi sallam. And those students did not narrate a single subject. There was of them who narrated in fiqh. There is of them who, so jurisprudence. There is of them who narrated in creed, aqaid. There is of them who narrated, for example, even in alchemy, in astronomy, in, in, in yani Imam Sadiq showed a breadth of knowledge during that time because he had this space to. So other than the fact that the Umayyad dynasty itself became more weak, the Abbasids are now trying to take over. 
some of those who come from Quraysh and Bani Hashim, because the Abbasids are also from Quraysh, but specifically from Bani Hashim, uh, they uh, also wanted to uh, take over uh, in terms of uh, uh, some sort of caliphate. You had an example, maybe, maybe we can get into it a bit, a bit later. Uh, you had the example of Al-Hassan, the son of Al-Hassan Al-Muthanna, who tried to mention that his that he he himself is the Imam, that the Imam Al-Mahdi, Ajal Ta'afar Jawah Sharif. He tried to claim that Imam. So during that time, you had all of those things going on. And this created more space for the Imam to basically, let's say, uh, spread the knowledge that he had, while all of them, as we say, bi'sahum baynahum. They are fighting each other and they are each uh, at war with each other and each trying to take the throne for themselves. So you just mentioned the political climate of the time of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Mm. How about the religious climate? We, we began to see many schools of thought begin to develop different ways of thinking about law, people maybe even deriving law outside of the Imam, for example. And major scholars who are known until today began to rise. So how do we look at this now? Uh, how did this, what role did this play in the life of Imam Sadiq? And what perhaps were of the interesting debates that the Imam had with these, or for example, with the atheists, with the Muslims even, from other schools in relation to different areas of religion? So Imam Sadiq alayhi afsalatu wasalam, during this time, uh, of course, when you open a university, and when you spread knowledge, and when you teach, there are those who take those teachings and then proclaim scholarly positions without being of a position to. And there are those who just think they are the most knowledgeable in that aspect and those who are, for example, uh, maybe certain things in their life affected them in a specific way for them to believe in specific things. And you had many atheists around his time. You had those who started calling towards themselves. Even from the Shia, you had those who, for example, before Imam Sadiq this there's something that, that began spreading during the time of Imam Zain al-Abideen, where you had those uh, uh, al-Firqa, I believe they call them al-Kaysaniyya, who followed Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyya, the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi afdul salati wa salam. Slowly they started to... Um, disappear and they're not present anymore. Then you had, for example, also from the Shia uh, that were there, Zaydiyya, uh, they started to appear. Uh, this is during the time of Imam Sadiq salam, after the martyrdom of Zayd. For, and maybe we can get into this a bit later as well, but Zayd never proclaimed Imam to himself. However, there are people that claimed it after him. After Imam Sadiq salam, you had the Ismailis. So from the Shia themselves, there was some uh, groups that were forming. I said there were atheists. As for when I say scholars that claimed scholarly level before they even reached it, when you look at, for example, Abu Hanifa, who was a student of Imam Sadiq alayhi afdal salati was salam, you know there's a narration that says that he himself, Abu Hanifa says, لَوْلَ السَّنَتَانْ لَهَلَكَ numan If it wasn't for the two years, then he would, have, he would have been nothing. He would have yeah. been finished. Yeah. What we need to realize it means he only studied for two years. Yes. And he became the major scholar. Thank you very or much. Marja, even. Yeah, it was bigger than a marja. Yeah. And bigger than a marja, yeah. even. In the, in the, the, the fi mathabat imam, we would say. I mean, in, in the position of an, of an imam, in a position of a person who is, who is giving. Of course, he, يعني, for them, this would be a much to hear. This is a person who is working based on ishtihad. However, and of course, his legacy remains into today because I believe at least 32% of the ummah today follow him in fiqh, and correct. that's the majority of the, the ummah. Correct. So, correct. of course, his legacy is huge. Yeah, correct. No, the majority of of the of the Sunnis are Hanafi uh, and in fact that's a reflection also of the total Muslim population because the majority are Sunni to begin with yes. the majority of them are Hanafis and also by the way you need to remember something which is that Abu Hanifa himself did not stay in a single land he traveled so for example he was uh, the, he spent some years in Kufa, he spent some years in Baghdad, he spent some years in, uh, even in, in Medina and, and other, other places, he spent all of those years. So, these types of scholars started to appear. Malik ibn Anas 
also a student of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi afdal salati wa salam although I believe from what I remember that he did not study for many years under Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam but what I mean is that there are those who studied under him and then went against him then there were those who did not study with him to begin with but were already of different thoughts and you have the example of many of those who were for example from the atheists that tried to uh, debate Imam Sadiq alayhi salam in the in the wujud of Allah Azza wa in the presence of Allah Azza the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of them, for example, being that famous story when one of the atheists prepared some uh, dust and then from that dust came some sort of insect and then he said, Look, I am the one that created them. So Imam Sadiq alayhi salam upon hearing this he said, Okay, if he is truly the one that created them, then let them let him tell you how many they are. And of them, how many are male, how many are female, and how much does each one of them weigh? By Allah, he will not be able to answer any of those questions, proving that he did not create them. So simple ways he actually used, subhanAllah, when we look at the, the debates of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, we realize that many of them, he demolished them with the most simple ways. For example, his name, I believe, either Abi Layla or Ibn Abi Layla, one of them. He was a Qadi, a judge, during the time of the Abbasids. And also during the time of the Umayyads, they also used him as a judge. Imam Sadiq one time asked him, he said to him, Oh, Abu Layla, how do you judge between the people? He said, I judge based on the book of Allah, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, and Umar and Abu Bakr. Or Abu Bakr and Umar. Okay. So this is what you judge on? Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Did you hear a narration from the Prophet that says, Aqbaakum Ali, Ba'di, the one who is best at judging after me is Ali ibn Abi Talib? He said, yeah. He said, so how do you follow? <laughs> how, how, how is it I use this method for judging? And the most simple of ways, the one narration, finished. One word, demolished. This is the way that Imam Sadiq actually used to used to debate because he was known even in his sifat that he used he he wouldn't talk much, and when he talked he talked to the point and exactly from what he wanted. A famous uh, debate that we were actually discussing before we started yes. filming as well, the debate between him and Abu Hanifa, where Abu Hanifa would say, uh, for, or he would believe in qiyas in measure, measurement in terms of ahkam, and this, this is a great faqih. He believes in measurement. So Imam al-Sadiq also in a very simple manner, he said, okay, no problem, ta'al. You believe in qiyas. What is worse? Killing or adultery? So no, surely killing is worse. So okay, so how is it that when it comes to killing, you need two witnesses? And when it comes to adultery, you need four. four. Okay, confused. No problem, no problem, stay confused. Let me ask you the next question. What is worse? A person, uh, sorry, what is more dirty? Uh, sorry, what, what is better? Salah, prayer, or siyam, fasting? Surely fasting, uh, I mean prayer is better. Is it okay, no problem, ta'ala. Why is it then in that case, when a lady goes through her menstrual cycle, the salah does not need to be re mm -hmm. repeated, but the siyam does? Yes. Confused again. No problem, stay confused. Let me ask you the next question. What is more dirty? Not what is more impure, what is more dirty? Urine or semen? He said, surely urine is more dirty. So, okay, so why is it that for semen a person has to perform ghusl but not the same as required for urine? He said, no, 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 I don't believe necessarily in qiyas, but I'm a person of ra'i, I'm a person of opinion. So, okay. What do you say about a person who has a slave? And him and his slave marry on the same day. And they make both of their wives pregnant on the same day. And their kids are born on the same day. And now this man who owns the slave leave the house and they go on travel. The house falls and gets demolished. The mothers both get killed and the two sons remain. Who is... The one who takes the worth and who is the one that doesn't? And what is the position? This is khalas. Here I can't answer anymore. Very simple ways used in debate, directly to the point, uh, exactly as needed, 
This was the way of Imam Asadiq alayhi salam. And this is the way he trained his companions. His companions were also trained for debate. You'll find even, from, for example, this great, great, great scholar, Al-Bahlul, who acted in a specific way, acted as though he was insane, yet the teachings he was teaching were amazing. You had the example of Al-Mu'min Al-Taq, who was a person uh, who was very much uh, literate, if that's appropriate to say here, and a person who was very knowledgeable when it comes to philosophy, especially in that of the existence of Allah Azza wa Jal, to the extent where some people, those who hated him, used to call him a shaytan al-taq. It's called al-mu'min al-taq, they call him a shaytan al-taq. You had many, many, many examples. Uh, Ahmed ibn al-Hassan al-Falaki, who was a scholar when it comes to astronomy, and all of these individuals used to debate those other individuals in their respected fields according to what Imam Sadiq used to teach them of methods of debate. Straight to the point, exactly as needed, directly to what uh, the question or the debate is surrounding. And at times, for example, he would order them, uh, uh, order them to debate and other times he would order them not to debate based on specific issues because Imam Sadiq did at certain points also uh, perform taqiyya for certain reasons, especially when it comes to uprisings against the tyrants, in certain occasions he did perform taqiyya and he did not actually join many of the uprisings or lead any of the uprisings, uprisings against the tyrants. Also, one of the, the greatest of students who is a teacher before he was even a student is Imam Musa al-Kadhim, the son of Imam al-Sadiq salam He himself, for example, at a very young age, Abu Hanifa would come and he would say, for example, you order us to not pray in front of open doors. Why is your son open, praying in front of an open door? He said to ask him. He would go to him and Imam Musa al-Kadhim would reply to him because Allah Azza wa Jal is closer to me than that door. So as Allah says in the Quran, وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلُ الْوَرِيدِ And we are closer to him than the jugular vein. So this is the environment that Imam Sadiq alayhi salam uh, lived in. And in, in compared to other Imams, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam his time in Medina, was it, was it peaceful for the majority? Were there many confrontations with the tyrants of the time? Or did this all come towards the end of his life? So Imam As-Sadiq by the way, just to mention something very quickly, which is during the Umayyad period, for the majority of it, yes, he was in Medina. During the Abbasid period, uh, he also spent a lot of the time in Medina, but he also went to Kufa. So we have, for example, in Kufa there is the mihrab of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. We know that he taught in the Masjid of Kufa. He taught some of his companions in the Masjid of Kufa. And we know that he himself visited the grave of Imam al Hussein alayhi afdhal salati wa salam. And he used to teach people how to visit the grave of Imam al Hussein. For example, Ziyarat Warith, the one of the most um, uh, one of the greatest ziyarat that we have for the ziyarah of Imam Hussein alayhi salam is narrated by Imam Sadiq alayhi afdal salati wa salam. He is the one that actually also this, this might link to your question, the political movement, uh, generally speaking. Look at how weak they were that finally Imam Sadiq alayhi salam was able to show the people where the grave of Imam Ali alayhi salam lies. But the grave of Imam Ali was hidden from the people as per his will to Imam al Hassan alayhi salam when yes. he buried him. They hid his grave. However, Imam al Sadiq was the Imam to reveal the grave to the people. Yes, there was occasions where Imam Zain Abdin visited the grave of Imam Ali, but only with the close companions. But now the location of the grave of Imam Ali alayhi salam became known. So, from that aspect, yes, there was, of course, even some of his trips to Iraq were based on orders from tyrants for him to come. So this keeps him, surely he was not in a resting place in Medina because at any point there would be tyrants calling him to go to other places. And at the same time, his house in Medina was burnt. And this is a very famous story, though I didn't really want to mention it, uh, especially on his Wulad, I will mention it anyway, which is that uh, during that time when they... Uh, burnt his house, this was during the end of his life of course, when they burnt his house, uh, he was seen crying for days. One of his companions would come to him and say, this, this is not the first time that they burn your house. It's not the first time. Uh, it's been done to the door of Fatima al-Zahra, it was done in Karbala. 
For he said to them, it is not because it is my house that they burnt. However, when I saw my women running from room to room, I remembered my aunt Zainab running from tent to tent. So this is the environment that he, that, that he lived in. Yes, from one aspect, he had more freedom in order to spread the true jurisprudence and aqaid that the Holy Prophet وسلم, came with. But at the same time, of course, tyrants uh, were increasing. I'm talking about 10 Umayyad Caliphs during his period and then two. By the way, when I say 10 Umayyad Caliphs during his period, I'm talking about his lifetime. As for his Imam, there were five, which is also a lot. So five Umayyad Caliphs during his life and then two from the Abbasids, that means he, he lived during the time of seven Caliphs. Then during his time, there was also uprisings, the most famous of which was Zayd uh, ibn Ali, the son of Imam Zayn al-Abidin Ali of the Rasulullah of the So his uncle, he rose up against the tyrants. Yes, Imam Sadiq did not did not rise up, but at the same time, he did not speak against Zayd or call him anything uh, that is derogatory to him. Rather, he said, if Zayd Zayd is a mu'min, a believer, and if he was alive, he would have called all of you towards my Imam. And sorry, go. On. So Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, the, like you said, there was many uprisings. We mentioned the one with Zayd, the son of Imam Zayn al-Abidin alayhi salam. How about the uprising of the Abbasids? They seemingly raised the banner of Ahl al-Bayt, indicating that they were uprising with the intention of bringing the Imama to, combining Imam and Khilafah, let's say, with, with the person at the home to be Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Why was the Imam so reluctant to join this uprising and also with there was a famous narration with Imam Sadiq and Harun Makki where the Imam seemingly indicates that if he had a certain number of people with him that were on the same page of him he would have uh, done his own uprising what does this tell us about the Imam and his and his psyche when it comes to things like uprisings so Imam Sadiq alayhi salam the Abbasid, let's say the Abbasid dynasty themselves were not the only people that, wrote, that claimed the banner of the Ahlul Bayt. There were many individuals that claimed the banner of the Ahlul Bayt. There were many individuals that uh, rose up in the name of the Ahlul Bayt. Many of them that wanted the Imam to be on their side, knowing that he is the most powerful in terms of knowledge. And, and this is what you find even during the time of Al-Ma'mun and the way he treated Imam Al-Radha alayhi salam. The Abbasid Caliphs, I remember a, a scholar once commented, he said, the problem with the, the difference between the Abbasid Caliphate and the Umayyad Caliphate is that the Umayyad Caliphate were clear in their nasb against the Ahlul Bayt, clear in their hatred towards the Ahlul Bayt. Whereas the Abbasid Caliphate, you will find that they kind of yudhhirun al-hub li uh, Ahlul Bayt. They used to show as if they used to love Ahlul Bayt. But of course, it was the complete opposite. And many examples you can see, including Harun imprisoning, for example, uh, Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi wa sallam, and bringing the most, uh, the most vicious of, of, of prison guards to guard his cell. As for Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, during this period, this transformation period, let's call it, between the Umayyad dynasty to the Abbasid dynasty, there was actually a meeting that was um, prepared. This meeting included Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, Hassan al Muthanna, his son Muhammad, al Safah, and al Mansur. Five individuals. Those were the five individuals in this meeting. Imam Sadiq Khawino. Al Hassan al Muthanna is the son of Imam al Hassan al Mushtaba. Yeah. He was present in Karbala at a very young age. He was injured and then he was taken back to the tents where he was treated after the battle. He was taken with the captives and then went back to Medina. This is Hassan al Muthanna, alive during that time. His son Muhammad, the son of Hassan al Muthanna, so the grandson of Imam al Hassan السلام, was also present. Safah is the first Abbasid Caliph and Al-Mansur is the second Abbasid Caliph that took over after Safah. During this meeting, Al-Hassan Al-Muthanna wanting to claim the Khilafah, he tried to play it smart by not calling it towards himself. He said, my son Muhammad is Al-Mahdi. So it is upon you to pay allegiance to him. 
This is where Imam Sadiq did not stay quiet. He said no. He is not Al-Mahdi. Which made Al-Hasan Muthanna very angry. As well as Muhammad and they left the Majlis. And he said in fact the person that will truly be taken over the Caliphate is a Safah and after him Al-Mansur. You might ask, in this political climate, why can't Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq do this? You mentioned it earlier. Imam al-Sadiq in many narrations, he mentions that I do not have the supporters in order to be able to rise up in this specific manner. And of course, he is the one who is most wise of his time and he knows best. Because there was, for example, an example of a person from Persia that sent him a message, a letter saying that we are ready in order to follow you and, and, and give you, pay you allegiance and it's upon you to overthrow the Abbasids. The Imam replied, he said, first of all, he was not from my Shia. And second of all, this هذا الزمن ليس بزماني. This era is not my era. Meaning this is not the era in which we will uh, rule over the world. Potentially, potentially. Referring to the era of Sahib al-Zaman, Ajala ta'ala Farajah al-Sharif, where that will be the true era of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim, afdala salatu wa salam, and maybe after that, the Raj'atu. However, generally speaking, this is the situation Imam Sadiq was in. Yes, there was two, he had students, but we also saw from his students, not all of them were from his Shia. Yes, he had those who loved him, but how many of them were truly from the Shia? How many of them, like that story of the one who was put in the oven, would be willing to sacrifice their life and answer to the Imam exactly as he would ask. For example, that companion that comes and, and the Imam would tell him that go and sit in this oven, they close the door, he would sit straight, he turns around, how many people do you have like this man? That would listen. When they opened the oven, he came out like there was nothing. So it wasn't about how many soldiers he was able to have by, him, by his side. It wasn't about how many companions he was able to have by his side. The Imam knew that this would be a danger to the Shia in order to, by, by him go. So instead what he chose to do is he chose to stay on the, the knowledge side of things. And this is why you have the famous companions of Imam Sadiq Ali of Sati Wasalam who truly are amazing, truly are amazing when it comes to history and read about Zurara for example. 90% of our fiqh that we read from uh, Rasal al-Amaliyya of of our mujtahideen today and our maraja' today, most of them come from the narrations from Zurara. And what an amazing heritage Imam Sadiq alayhi salam left as a, as a result of this. Jabir bin Hayyan in alchemy, and I mentioned earlier Mu'min al-Taq and others. This is what Imam Sadiq decided to focus on, and he laid a true foundation for the true fiqh and the aqaid that the Prophet came with. Does this mean that fiqh and aqaid wasn't spoken about before? Yes, it was. We have fiqhi aspects spoken about by Imam Zain Abdin through his du'as. We have aqaid aspects spoken through the words of Fatima al-Zahra in the Sermon of Fidik. We have aqaid and fiqhi issues spoken about during the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussain. All of them had those issues. However, this is at a point where it is more clear directly as a, as a let's call it a lesson, as a syllabus of this is your fiqh and this is your aqaid. Imam Sadiq السلام, was married to Hamid al barbariya mm. Hamid the Berber. How did his knowledge transition to her and what role did she have in society, maybe with the female of the community, for example, in terms of the spreading of ilm? So if you, if you look at the life of our Imams, very interestingly you will find that many of the women who are related to them, whether it is their spouses or their daughters, were of the most knowledgeable of their time. Uh, one, for example, let me just use this opportunity to mention one individual because I truly I feel like she is oppressed. Wallah, she is oppressed. You know when we mention Karbala, we mention Ruqayya and Sukayna. Ruqayya being martyred in Sham, who was left? Sukayna. I ask you, when I say Sukayna to you, what do you imagine? Young girl. That's what you imagine, right? Oppressed. Yeah. Rather, Sukayna became a great lady, a great lady, he was the most knowledgeable of the ladies in Medina during her time. Same. And she used to constantly have uh, uh, lessons and, and uh, lesson circles with the women of Medina. She was known for this. 
Yes, when we remember Sukaina, we remember a young girl. This, this what, this what our minds go to because our yeah. minds are linked to the tragedy of Karbala, which is not a bad thing. Yeah. It's not a bad thing. Yeah. However, at the same time, we need to understand what a status she she came to because Imam Al Baqir also was a young man during Karbala, uh, maybe two or three years of age, maximum five if we were to take some narrations. However, Imam Al Baqir became Imam Al Baqir alayhi afdal salati was salam. Likewise with the spouses of our Imams. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, and this is a lesson for us, when he was at home, it wasn't just a matter of, I teach outside and at home it's a different story. No, his lessons continued at home. His raising of the family con continued for those who were old and for those who were young. And that should reflect on our lives. Because as a result, as a result, his family members became of those who were most Pious and best, which is why, by the way, and I know this about his wife, but to to show you, even in the example of Ismail, the son of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, who some people claim to be the Imam after he didn't claim Imam, he died during the time of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. In fact, we have narrations that mention in order for the Imam to make sure that no one will follow him after uh, follow him after him, he made sure that he uncovered his face three times before his burial and said, who is this man? They said, Ismail. Is he dead or alive? He is dead. Yeah. Oh Allah, witness that I have told these individuals. Anyway, for people still followed him after. But why? Ismail was a pious man, known in his knowledge, known uh, in terms of his, uh, his jurisprudence of the best students of his father, Imam Sadiq alayhi of the salati was salam. And likewise with his spouse and who would be able to then interact with the female community and be able to be of those who would raise the females in terms of uh, making them more learned and make them closer to Allah Azza wa Jal and allow them to spread the message uh, across uh, the other women, with That's the other women. And also in regards to Imam Sadiq's mother, Umma Farwa, who we yeah. mentioned earlier, there is the controversial uh, narration which the Imam is alleged to have said, where supposedly he said, وَلَدَنِي أَبُو بَكَرْ مَرَّتَيْنِ Abu Bakr gave birth to me twice in relation to the lineage of his mother going back to the first Khalifa in, from Abu both Bakr. sides. So how do we respond to this uh, as many of our followers, many of the followers of the School of Ahl al is constantly put to them? How do they respond to this uh, uh, through basic looking at the lineage and perhaps coming to a conclusion where, uh, a logical conclusion? So in terms of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, his father is Imam al-Baqir. His father is Imam Ali, Zain al-Abidin. His father is Al-Imam al-Hussein, al-Shaheed. His father is Ali ibn Abi Talib, married to Fatima to Zahra, daughter of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. As for Umm Farwa, that is Imam Sadiq's mother, the daughter of Al-Qasim, the, the great scholar, Al-Qasim, the great scholar, the son of Muhammad, the great companion and great scholar, the great companion of Ali alayhi salam, the son of Abu Bakr. However, when I look at Muhammad, I link him to Amir al-Mu'minin before I link him to anyone else. Yes. Because I find in narrations that Muhammad would come to Ali ibn Abi Talib and he would say to him, Mudda yadaka li ubayu'ak. Uh, give me your hand so that I can pay you allegiance. He said, لَقَدْ بَيَعْتَنِي مِنْ قَبْلِي I've already paid me allegiance. He said, yes. I've paid you allegiance upon your wilaya. But now I'm paying you allegiance upon the bara'a, the disassociation from my father and his friend. This is Abu Bakr. Uh, I mean Muhammad, the son of Abu Bakr. Muhammad, the son of Abu Bakr, in many occasions, in many narrations, Afwan, is known to be of those that were raised in the household of Ali ibn Abi Talib and under the guidance of Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib. So yes, maybe lineage-wise, if I look at Umm Farwa, her great-grandfather is Abu Bakr. However, when I look at Muhammad, he is this great Abid, this great worshipper, this great... Which is why even in the, in the Battle of the Camel, when, when Aisha looks at uh, who is guarding her, her camel and she sees Muhammad, and she, she says, who is there? He says, I am Muhammad. He says, oh, is this the, the Khabith ibn al-Tayyib? Mm -hmm. He says, bel al-Tayyib ibn al-Khabith. 
This is how he describes himself in front of his sister, Aisha. She says, is this the one, the disgraceful one, the son of the great one? He said, no, in fact, I am the great one, the son of the disgraceful one. So this is Muhammad. And yes, Imam Sadiq being from a lineage like the lineage of Muhammad is, 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 is not a bad thing at all. It's not a bad thing at all. For Muhammad, uh, Radwanullah Ta'ala Alayh, the son of Abu Bakr, was known between the Ahlul Bayt السلام, to be close to the Ahlul Bayt and to be of their closest companions. Al Qasim, his son, just to get to his mother, Um Farwa, Al Qasim, his son, if you look at narrations, you will find he was of the most learned scholars during his time and of the ones who was closest to the Ahlul Bayt during his time. And from him came Um Farwa. He was married to Imam al-Baqir one of the most knowledgeable of ladies and the most pious of ladies and one of those who loved the Ahlul Bayt so much and from her came Imam al-Sadiq And just finally, what, what lessons can we take generally from the life of Imam al-Sadiq especially maybe perhaps in the pursuit of knowledge, yeah. the pursuit of the Qur'an let's say for example uh, and that and its importance in the life of a Muslim and a Shi'i especially. Uh, you know, it's good that you mentioned this because I wanted to mention this earlier as well, which is uh, the relationship Imam Sadiq had with the Quran. That yes, we speak about his his contribution to jurisprudence, to alchemy, to astronomy, uh, to aqaid. However, he had he also had a great contribution to the tafsir of the Holy Quran and many of the tafasir that we read today are a result of the works of Imam Sadiq where he showed the true meanings and the asbab, asbab al-nuzul and the meanings behind these verses a lot of them Imam Sadiq speaks about maybe we don't have time to go over them uh, but inshallah on another occasion we can talk about some of the verses especially for example Ya Ayatuha Nafs al Mutma'inna is one that I always use as a tafsir from Imam Sadiq a beautiful, beautiful tafsir he gives in that regard however from that aspect, he built a relationship with all aspects of, uh, of, of, of this religion and he urged people to always become more knowledgeable in, that, in, in their religion and do not just inherit your religion, rather you need to learn it. And there are many narrations where he says, لَوْ أَتَانِي شَاب لَمْ يَتَفَقَّهْ فِي الدِّينِ شَيْءٍ لَأَوْجَعْتُ ظَهْرَهُ ضَرْبًا بِالصِّيَاطِ If a youth was to come to me and they do not have they have not uh, given themselves or uh, seek to knowledge in their religion, then I would treat them in such and such manner, urging people to seek knowledge, urging people to become uh, more knowledgeable in their jurisprudence and aqaid. And then at the same time, you will find alongside urging people to become more knowledgeable in those aspects, to be careful with, what, with that knowledge that you have. You might ask me, what do I mean? Unfortunately, I wasn't going to actually speak about this because uh, your question pushed me to speak about it from the life of Imam Sadiq. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we'll go over it very quickly. Unfortunately, we will find that many individuals, upon reading a single book, or upon reading a single hadith, if it wasn't for those two years, the problem is that those two years, this one year, this one book that we read is not enough in order for us to, to, to think that we have enough knowledge to represent our school of Ahlul Bayt. It is very unfortunate, very unfortunate that we see that many people go to the forefront of defending, Jazakallah Khair for trying to defend the, the, the school, Jazakallah Khair. From the bottom of my heart, first of all, Jazakallah Khair. However, at times what happens is when we go forward to defend like in that manner but we do not have the knowledge to come with it or the correct knowledge to come with it or the correct arts of debate to come with it you will do more harm than you will do good so this religion and this risala of the holy prophet that you are trying to defend you are you are distracting it more than you are defending it which is why when we look at how does this link to the imam Imam al-Sadiq used to teach the youth from a very young age, he used to urge them to learn from a very young age. All of them had knowledge in all of the aspects that is important for them to know in and other who became specialists in certain aspects. Specialists. I mentioned al-Mu'min al-Taq, specialist in what? 
علم الكلام the philosophy of the existence of Allah عز وجل هشام the companion of Imam Sadiq a specialist he, he's great in عقائد but a specialist in إمامة this specializing each individual insight they became a scholar in each and every single one of those specific specialty and when it came to debate certain individuals were sent to debate on specific topics and others were not sent to debate on specific topics and certain individuals upon sending them to debate in a specific occasion were told not to debate on other occasions out of the wisdom of the Imam well we have to end it here on this magnanimous day as we said at the start not just the wilad of Imam Sadiq but also the wilad of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi perfect duo in every aspect so inshallah you can go home and celebrate with your family likewise to you inshallah may your life always be filled with celebration and happiness likewise Thank you very much, brothers and sisters, the viewers of Imam Hussein TV, for joining us again on the, this episode of The Valiant. We wish you a magnanimous day on this, the 17th of Rabi'ah al-Awwal, the wilad of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and the man we just touched upon just now, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. And may all of you be granted the ziyar of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam in, gen in Jannatul Baqi, insha'Allah, this time next year. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.